I'm thrilled to have here on the program Warren Moon. Good to see you, sir. How you doing, man? I'm doing great. I saw JB Smooth in uh, in Houston in a stand up. He's really, really funny. He is a funny guy. <laughs> he's a funny guy. He's got a great delivery. Well, he's. He, uh, did you see him over there? Did, I, did you I see didn't him see him. No. Okay. Well, we'll get him out here in a second because he's, you know, he's America's guest right here. Well, these fans love you, Warren. The well, <laughs> they love you. A lot of them weren't born when I when I played here in Houston. Who was <laughs> Who was born when Warren Moon played here in Houston? A round of applause. Yeah, but, they, they, those folks, they could only cheer because they couldn't raise their arms. You know, <laughs> I mean, you know. Very supportive fans, though. Uh, they did a great job of not only supporting me, but my family and the things I did in the community, you know, off the field. And and I'm just sorry we didn't get them a championship while yeah. I was here, but we had a lot of exciting teams. You know what I mean? And one of, one of the amazing things when you go up to NRG Stadium is just how monstrously large that stadium is, certainly compared to right next door. The Astrodome is still sitting there, and it yeah. looks... It looks so small compared to. I know, and it seems like 65, 70,000 people, but they were they were smashed in there, and they made a lot of noise. And it was the first dome stadium ever, so that's one of the reasons why they haven't <sighs> knocked it down because it's like a historical monument here in this city. When was and, the last time you were in there? Um, man, maybe about 10 years ago. They, they don't do much in there anymore, but there's a lot of people that want to tear it down. There's a lot of people that don't, and uh, I, I'm more on the side of don't. But I know it costs the city money just to keep it up, and. And everything is about money these days, right? And of course, we all know about the run and shoot, and 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 now we see offenses five wide all the time now, and we see spread them out. Certainly, at college, funny how you see that? It's funny how you <laughs> see it, and you know now you've got Atlanta coming in with. You take a look at all the metrics, and we had Kurt Warner on in hour number one. Their their numbers are akin to, if not in some ways, better over a sixteen game season than the the, the greatest show on turf. Right. Do you see? Your offense from the Oiler days in, in, in some of these offenses? A you ton see? of it. I, I see it in uh, New England's offense. I see it throughout the league. A lot of our pass concepts, uh, especially from war, four wideouts, all the different switches and zone and reads and different things like that. Yeah. I see all of that. And, and back when we were doing it, it was like this is some kind of pop gun offense and what this thing will never work in the league. But what they've been able to do is take the, the good things out of it and, and incorporate it into offenses today. But you also have these big – hybrid tight ends that can run down the field like wide receivers so you always have a tight end on the field and that that was the drawback of our offense we didn't have a tight end on our roster so when you wanted to run the football you all you really couldn't run it the way you wanted to because there was no tight end in the offense Warren Moon sitting here on the Rich Eisen show set here in Houston and we're here in Houston Atlanta's coming and why haven't I heard the name Jerry Glanville more often <laughs> this week Warren. that's a good thing you know it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a good thing but um, Atlanta's got a new identity now. You know, Dan Quinn is doing doing a great job. He's kind of brought that whole, not just the team, but that organization together with this brotherhood model that they go by. And and uh, that team really seems to love one another. They seem to enjoy being around one another. Mm -hmm. And it's something I think he got from being in Seattle for those number of years that he was there as defensive coordinator. He saw how, saw how close that football team was, and it took them to a championship. And he's kind of doing the same thing there in Atlanta. Well, I mean... We've been here now, this is uh, our sixth hour of a 15-hour week. <laughs> Haven't heard many people pounding the table saying Atlanta's going to win. LaDainian Tomlinson was here at the end of the show yesterday and thinks they're going to win. Flat out said it. What do you think? About I think I think if it's a high-scoring game, Atlanta wins because they're in an offensive rhythm right now that, that I had just haven't seen in a while, the way they're moving the football to so many different people. You know, they talk about Bill Belichick knows how to take away your best uh, offensive weapons and that type of thing. Who is their best offensive weapon? Of course, Julio Jones is the name that, that steps out there, but I've seen games where he's caught two balls and they still score 35 points because they have so many people that he's spreading the ball around to. And and Matt's doing a great job of not only going to his first and second read, he's going third and fourth read. And, and those running backs, when you get them in space and he throws them the football outside the backfield, they make huge plays, too. So they make you defend the whole football field, Atlanta's offense. Well, I mean, one of those games you could easily say was the divisional playoff victory over Seattle that you were in the building for because you call Seahawks yeah. games. If Fill in the blank here. I don't usually do this, but uh, this is a, 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 a direct way uh, of asking the question. The Seattle Seahawks are not here because? Uh, inconsistency uh, and, and injuries. A lot of injuries, key injuries down the stretch. You know, they lose Tyler Lockett. They lose Earl Thomas. Uh, they played w without a lot of their key guys down the stretch of the season. 
And then their offensive line was very young and very inexperienced, so they were kind of inconsistent. So I think those are the reasons. There was also an article, I forget who, I shouldn't be bringing it up when I don't know exactly the columnist who, who wrote it, but I did see it in the local Seattle newspaper, uh, calling the team unlikable now. That it seems that, you know, with Richard Sherman yeah. going at a local reporter and Michael Bennett having uh, an expletive laden conversation after the playoff loss, would you say that, that the 12s are down on the Seahawks? A I don't know right if, they're, if they're all down on them, but I think that team, I think they understand they need to, um, they need to act better next year. You know, they just need to, to be more classy. They need to be more mature. Uh, I know this is a very emotional team, and, and Pete lets this team be emotional, lets them show their, their emotions and their, uh, their feelings, but I think they took it a little bit too far in a couple of certain instance, instances this year. And I think that's something he's probably going to reel back in this offseason or when he gets the team back in in April uh, to talk about this next year because they took it just to a, a level where it was probably a little bit too far. And I think it really affected the football team in some ways and, and brought them a lot of negative publicity that they don't need because there's a lot of really good guys on that team, but they get misunderstood sometimes when you have outbursts like that. What was the name of the columnist? It was uh, Matt Calkins of the Seattle Times. So is this something that you speak to, that you sit down with Sherman or, or anybody else that you think needs to have this conversation? I'm going to let their leadership in the organization take care of that first, and if I feel like I need to step in, I, 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 I will. But um, – you know, that's Pete's football team, and th those are his leaders on the team. So he probably needs to reel those leaders in on their leadership council and talk to them first and then let the rest of it disperse through the football team. Warren Moon here on the Rich Eisen Show. Uh, so who do you counsel? Who do you pick up the phone and talk to and just say, hey, uh, I'll give two cents, or just you give your phone number out to and say, hey, uh, call me if you want two cents from Warren Moon. There's a lot of guys around the league, you know, but I talk to Russell all the time. You know, he's a guy that I got to know as a rookie when he came to Seattle, and and we talk all the time. There's a chance we might even train some together this off season if if our schedules work out. But um, you know, there's a lot of young quarterbacks. Uh, Tyrod Taylor. Uh, I mean, I keep in touch with a lot of guys. Uh, EJ Manuel. Um, you know, I even used to talk with uh, Tom Brady early in his career. You know, I, I'll give advice to anybody who will take it just because I've been through a lot in my career and uh, I've seen the, the good, I've seen the bad. And if I can do anything to make the transition easier for any of these young guys coming into the league, I'm willing to do it because I know how tough it is to play that position. So when he was uh, receiving it, what advice were you giving Tom Brady? You know, just talking about staying consistent, talking about, the, you know, the hard work that goes into to, uh, to being a quarterback, the more work you can put in. Uh, the more you're going to get out of it, just things like that. And, and it wasn't a whole lot that I had to tell him because he had a, a lot of that work ethic anyway. Mm -hmm. But uh, you, you can never be wrong reinforcing the things that, that somebody's doing just to let them know that, okay, I am doing the right thing because this guy's telling me the same things I'm already doing. Well, I was going to say that Brady knew uh, because he's a Michigan man, but that would open the front door to something I probably don't want to hear back from you, Warren. <laughs> Which is no, I'm not going to go there a with A conversation you. about yeah. the Rose Bowl and <laughs> things of that nature, one of the many disappointments of uh, Michigan Rose Bowl history. Um, Deshaun Watson, what about Deshaun Watson? Have you reached out to him? You know, I've met him. I met him at the uh, College Football Awards, and I told him if there's anything I can do to help you with your career, uh, let me know. I know he's, um, he's training with a guy that I know very well out in California, so I might reach out for him at some time during the offseason and talk to him. What do you think of his game? I, I really like it. I like that he plays his best games in his biggest game. He sure does, doesn't and he? And that's what you want your quarterback to be, the best in, in the biggest times, and he's been that. I mean, he's been that against Alabama two times. Every time he played Florida State, every time he played whoever in the big games, he was at his best. What about Cam Newton? Do you reach out to him? Do you talk to yeah, him? Yeah, we've talked. And, and, uh, What's going through his mind right you now, know, Warren? Cam is kind of his own guy, as, as you can tell. And he's he's got a way that he wants to do things that he thinks will work. Cam is a great kid. He's a great um, person. He's a very caring person. He comes from a really good family, but he's a little flamboyant and he's a very emotional guy. You know, he wears his emotions on his sleeve. So if he can reel those things in and just kind of be a little bit more under control from time to time, and I think he's doing that. I think I see signs of that. He's going to be fine. He's a tremendous talent, and we've already seen that. He's won, already won a, a um, MVP and he's he's been to a Super Bowl. So we know he can play the game. He's just got to refine a few things in his personality, and he'll be fine. Do you think refs are not officiating him properly? I do. I, I really do. You just look at some of the hits. I mean, you, you, can't, uh, you can't 
cover your eyes up for some of those hits that he takes. I mean, it, it's unbelievable some of the shots that he takes and doesn't get flags for. But I think a lot of it's because he's so big and strong, and they probably feel like, well, that, that hit didn't hurt him. It might have hurt another guy because – his body probably like torqued more than, than right. His it doesn't body does. look as violent yeah, exactly. on him when he's receiving. But that doesn't matter. As a quarterback, if you're hitting the head or if you're hitting your knees, a flag should be thrown. But how does no that matter how big you are? How does that affect him? Have you had that those conversations with him about how it? I have not had those okay. conversations, but uh, I'm sure I can tell by the way he reacts that it affects him. You know, he just wants to be treated fairly, and sometimes it comes across as he's look. It looks like he's whining about it, but. He's got a valid point because one of those hits could be a career-ending hit. You never know. So you want to make sure he's being taken care of just like every other quarterback in the league. Before I let you go, let's throw out some red meat for the Houston crowd here. What, what's your favorite Oilers moment? What do you When you think about your Houston Oilers career? You know, when I, when I first came here, we were a 2-14 and 14 team when I came in. It was a, a matter of building the football team, right? And we finally got to the point where we got to the playoffs and – we won that first playoff game, I think it was against uh, Seattle, believe it or not, in the Astrodome. So that was a huge moment because we went through some lean years to get finally to the playoffs and win that first playoff game. And that was something these people had waited for a long time because there had been some really, really lean years prior to me getting there and then the first couple of years I was here. Did you ever try on Bum Phillips' hat? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, but Come Bum on. was a really good friend of mine. Uh, I really loved the man. He was he was part. I had a TV show at that time when I was in town, and he had a segment on the show. Come so, on now. So I saw him every week. The Warren Moon Show. Yes, it was. Where they segment with Bum Phillips. Yes, 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 we did. That's got to live on YouTube <laughs> somewhere, right? You got to find you, that. I'm sure you can on find it. it. And what was what were those segments? Were you were the host of it, and just Q and A with your coach? Me or? and Gifford Nielsen were the host okay. and co-host, and yeah. then. A uh, bum had a segment where he came in and talked about the different things that went on throughout the league that week. Right. And then I noticed you just didn't even respond to Jerry Glanville's name being mentioned. No. <laughs> <laughs> Great X and O coach, but uh, a little bit too much into himself. <laughs> not for long. Right? So there will not be a ticket left for Elvis here at Super Bowl 51. Well, I, in other I words. hope not. <laughs> Warren, I love you, man. I love having you on, and um, I'll see you back in Los Angeles. So right, I'd love Rich. to have you on uh, anytime, please. You know I'm always okay. available for Great. you. Great, I will do that. Warren Moon, everybody, right, right. here in Houston. The Rich Eisen Show, weekdays at noon Eastern on Audience.